Yeah, I was born in Cincinnati uh, in the middle of the last century. <laughs> and um, my father was a jazz guitarist and a very good one and well known in the area. And um, my mother was a classical pianist and had graduated from the conservatory and was a music teacher. And my earliest memories were uh, uh, being, we had one of those Victrolas and my father had the Oscar Peterson trio with Ray Brown and Herb Ellis and I fell in love with this record. And uh, I'd get off the school bus and I'd run in and that would be the first thing I'd do, would put that, that record on. So I was emotionally involved right from the beginning. So I went off to play uh, tuba in a high school band and a marching band, and, but I thought, you know, uh, I was big for my age, and I thought, you know, I can, I can take up the bass because it's big and heavy like the tuba, and nobody wants to play it, and I can start it at a late age. And after school, when a clarinet player says, uh, anybody play bass, we're going to have a jam session. Now. I didn't, I never played a bass, and, uh, but I said, yeah, I played a bass. So he said, go get your bass, and I said, uh, well, my bass is not here. And he said, well, just go uh, in the practice room, there's a few basses in there. So now I'm trapped. So I carry it in, and there's a few kids playing, and I start thumping. I knew which side of it to stand on. <laughs> And uh, uh, I didn't even know the names of the strings, but I, I had good time, natural, pretty natural time. And uh, so we're playing along, and I'm thumping along, just playing whatever. And they said, after we finish this, you're our bass player. <laughs> I go home and I tell my dad I want a bass. He said, okay, yeah, it's the only instrument you can buy in the morning and go to work on that night. And he said, well, if you're gonna play it, you gotta, you gotta play it right. So I t started taking classical lessons with uh, the principal bassist in the Cincinnati Symphony. But they both said, well, if you're gonna be a musician, you have to you know, get a teaching degree like my mother did. You gotta have something to fall back on. Now I've gone from the age of 15, now I'm 18, I'm going into the conservatory. By the age of 18, I was playing at the Playboy Club in Cincinnati. Now I'd be up till two o'clock in the morning playing in a club the night before, and it's eight o'clock in the morning. I stopped going to the class, and I'm playing all the, all the time at night. And I told my folks, I'm not going back to the conservatory. I just want to play, I want to study the bass. I don't want to, I don't want a teaching degree. I don't want to, I just want to play. Uh, and when I was 20 years old, Woody Herman man came through town and they'd had a string of bad bass players and a drummer friend of mine in Cincinnati recommended me to Woody and I got the job at the age of 20 with the Woody Herman band. And what happens when you get a job with a band like that, basically you get two weeks. And if you work, it works out, then you stay on, if not, you know. So it was kind of the last of the big, the big band era. They were road rats. A lot of them were road rats. You have no responsibilities other than just to get on the stage and play and everything else is taken care of. You have a room, you, you don't have to have any family connections. All you had to do was be on time and play and uh, didn't even have to do that all the time. One, one time we drove all night, we got, the Danny Kay show needed, uh, somebody canceled and it was a live TV show. So we got a chance for Woody's band to go on the Danny Kay show and then uh, we did uh, the Ed Sullivan show, you know, so it was it was all this kind of mix of stuff. Then we got a State Department tour of Africa. We went to Cairo, we went to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So they arranged, they started putting us out in the middle of African villages to play 
for the people. That was an experience because they'd never seen these instruments before, and they didn't know what to think. <laughs> we didn't really win any uh, followers over there. Well, I left Woody's band after about two years uh, because uh, I you know, pretty much had enough of the road. I was lucky to be able to experience this. I think for a bass player, too, what it does for your time. But something clicks after a while and you just, you can do it, you know. And uh, so for time, it was, uh, I think, a really uh, an important experience. Well, I, after I, I left Woody's band, um, I did go back and sub with him a few times uh, when they needed a bass player, but I went back to Cincinnati, I got married, and uh, uh, started playing. Again, it got the Playboy Club job back, which was, was great. And then after about a year or so there, I'm playing the same clubs with the same people all the time. and. Um, I needed some more stimulation and uh, other players to play with. And uh, my wife, she said, who do you want to play with? And I mentioned, you know, Sonny Rollins, Jim Hall. I mentioned a bunch of Zoot Sims. She said, well, where are they? And I said, well, they're in New York. And she said, well, then you should be in New York, don't you think? It was our first weekend in New York, and the phone rings, and he said, uh, uh, we need you uh, tonight with Buddy Richard's band, so get, get here as, as fast as you can, play the second show, and bring your upright and your electric bass. I get there, and on the bandstand there are two stacks of 500 charts each on each side. Now the thing that people don't realize with a bass player, with a bass, you got a bass in your hand, you got no place to put the bass. So you have one hand to go through the charts and pull up the chart and then open up the charts. So Buddy Rich comes up, ignores me, gets on, sits down, he goes, 202. By the time I get the chart up and open it up, they're already eight bars into the tune. It was just awful. And he, we did play I, uh, one tune with the curtain closed. We just played a blues. I guess he wanted to just uh, maybe let the guys play or something. He got up, walked by, and didn't say thank you, nothing, just walked out. A real jerk, this guy. There's so many bad stories, but one of the funniest that I ever heard about him was a trumpet player who worked with him was on a golf course out playing golf. And he sees a guy take his golf bag down to the lake and throw the golf bag into the lake and stomp off. And he looks at him, he said, says to his friends, you know, that's Buddy Rich. And so they're all laughing. And then pretty soon he comes walking back down. He wades out into the lake picks up his golf bag, unzips a little pocket, takes out his car keys, <laughs> throws the bag back in the lake and he walks out. Okay. So we moved to New York. I actually got a job with Eddie Arnold, the uh, country music singer. At the same time, I also, a friend of mine was writing for James Brown. Uh, Dave Matthews, Ranger, was writing, was doing big band arrangements for James. And they needed some rhythm section players. So I got to actually go on the road with James Brown. Was, uh, we played the big band arrangements. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And just to be on the stage, watch those guys, they were great. And uh, uh, James worked worked the hell out of them, practiced them like mad.
Dave Brubeck wrote a mass back in 19 in the 60s, I think, and he had uh, became uh, was converted to Catholicism, and his wife, who was a, a confirmed atheist, they always had this kind of uh, tension between them because she really couldn't get with any of that Holy Ghost stuff. And every night they would have cocktails at uh, uh, five, and then they would go downstairs and play the piano until dinner was ready at six or so. And he had a motion sensor light, so when you go down the stairs, the light comes on. And um, after he died, at five o'clock every night, this light comes on. It kept happening every night. And I asked her about one of the last things before she died, I asked her, is that light still coming on? And she texted me back, she said, yeah. And you know, after she died, I asked her daughter-in-law, is the light still coming on? No, the light stopped after she died. That would be exactly the kind of thing that Dave would do to her <laughs> to let her know that there's something else going on. You know? and your father, did they ever, <laughs> can you tell me a little about what their was, attitude about that they ever come around? And well, my dad, my dad had, uh, you know, real problems, I think ego uh, problems with the fact that I started out as Clarence Moore's son and he ended up as being Michael Moore's father because I really had the career he never had. He stayed in Cincinnati. Neither of them would really never acted very proud of what I did. But when my father died and I inherited his guitar, inside his guitar case he had write-ups about me that he would show his, his friends and other musicians. The thing about the bass is um, the ability uh, to play with so many different kinds of styles of jazz. The fact that you can float from style to style and the, the common denominator in all of it is rhythm. That's the common, if you've got good time, it doesn't matter, you can play any style of, of uh, jazz or rock.